Technology and growth have been largely out of favor for most of 2022, but will current economic conditions and fiscal policy actually pave the way for big gains in select technology themes come next year? Well, joining me now with insights is Jay Jacobs. He's BlackRock's U.S. head of thematics and active equity ETFs. Thanks for joining me today, Jay. Yeah, it's great to be here, Alyssa. Great to see you. All right. Well, like I said, growth and technology have really been out of favor. So it seems like that's going to require active investors to get creative and more selective if they want to outperform. What are you seeing out there? That's exactly right. I mean, I think what people don't realize was that from 2020, you know, April 2020 to the end of 2021, that was a really exceptional and unusual period where buying kind of anything and growth really seemed to work and people you know genuinely had generally had pretty successful trading strategies just getting more exposure to growth stocks during that period of course the reverse has been true in 2022 which i think has been painful for many investors but we often get this question of you know when should i go back into growth when should i be loading up on tech again and I, I just think that's the wrong question, that we're not going back to 2020 and 2021 where a rising tide is going to lift all growth ships. Instead, this is a unusual and difficult market environment. We have persistently high inflation. We have rising rates. We have the potential for an economic recession. Investors need a new playbook for 2023 and beyond. And we think the answer is it's not about more or less growth. It's what are you allocating to within growth? What are the opportunities that can do well in this uncertain, challenging economic environment, but also have those powerful long-term growth tailwinds that growth investors expect. Right, so given that economic backdrop, there are some challenges, but also some opportunities. So lay out what that looks like for active growth investors. What might they be looking to, to get those winners, those winning areas? Absolutely. So, you know, we'll start with the we, we have three buckets, but I'll start with our first one, which is looking at fiscal policy as a ballast. Um, the government can be one of the biggest spenders in the world. So where the government money goes, that can really kind of provide, you know, a bit of stability to um, certain industries or certain companies that really get to benefit from getting that uh, that expenditure. So when you look, where is the where is the government spending money? Well, recently, a lot of the increases have been in areas like infrastructure with the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, which passed in 2021. Uh, it's in areas like clean energy and electric vehicles, which are getting about $370 billion allocated by the Inflation Reduction Act. So you're seeing the government, the U.S. government, is getting very specific about channeling billions of dollars to very specific themes. And this isn't just a U.S. story. We're seeing this in Europe as well. Uh, there's another you know, $300 billion or so allocated by European programs to uh, infrastructure and electric vehicles and clean energy. So where government spending goes, we expect to feel a little bit more um, uh, of a stabilizer effect in those areas because it's just not going to be as economically sensitive if you have that government backing behind it. So that's really the first bucket that we're looking at, uh, infrastructure, clean energy, and electric mm -hmm. vehicles. Great. Uh, so uh, let's dig into that a little bit more specifically with EVs. I know one of the challenges that a lot of uh, EV companies are, are facing now are the uh, component costs. Lithium, uh, you know, we're hearing a lot about right now. How does that uh, sort of factor into the economics of these different companies, even with all of that uh, government investment? Well, we've seen rising uh, prices for electric vehicle companies uh, recently. So on one hand, let, let's think about it in supply and demand. Demand for a lot of electric vehicles has been insatiable. Uh, it, you, it is actually difficult to buy a F-150 Lightning right now or to buy a Model 3 long range. They're simply, they've shut down order taking basically. So the demand is there. I think these companies are realizing one, they can increase prices and still get a lot of demand. I think two, they're realizing they kind of do have to increase prices because um, because of the raw material shortages that we're facing. And then third, because of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, where the U.S. government is providing up to $7,500 in tax credits to people who buy electric vehicles, it creates a little bit more of a buffer for those manufacturers as well. Because people can take $7,500 off the list price, um, they can raise the price a little bit, and that creates more profit margin. I think what's exciting about that is that because of this really strong demand, car companies are showing that they do have a path to profitability making electric vehicles, which has been the big question over the last few years. So tax credits, more incentives to build out supply chain infrastructure in the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act, all of this we think is going to be very positive for electric vehicles over not only 2023, but far beyond. 
Yeah, an interesting story unfolding there. And then in terms of clean energy, is it primarily solar that investors should be focused on or what else within clean energy is uh, potentially appealing? No, I think we can look across the value chain of of, uh, of clean energy. It's certainly solar. It's only certainly wind. It's some of the components that go into building things like solar panels and, and wind turbines. The reality is that we are in, because we are in this inflationary environment, investors want a little more price certainty wherever they can have it. And when you look at clean energy, one of the big differences between how it's produced versus how fossil fuel energy is produced is more of that cost is up front. You're paying for the solar panel or you're paying to build the wind turbine. But once it's out there, the maintenance is pretty low. And so it's really kind of all up, you know, kind of front loaded costs. And then you get to produce electricity and sell it at the market rate versus with fossil fuel based energy. They're constantly buying oil, constantly buying uh, gas or, or coal, which is more susceptible to inflation throughout you know, the life cycle of that plant. So simply if you're looking at it from how do I control for inflation and how do I get more certainty around electricity prices? Clean energy takes, uh, you know, takes the cake on that. So we think because of the inflationary environment, as well as because of the growth stimulus from the uh, from government programs, the clean energy is really going to continue to be in favor. And I know you're also focused on the healthcare sector, which we have seen a lot of money rotating into in recent months and uh, potentially attractive there due to the defensive kind of growth angle. But as we've seen. Uh, in recent trading sessions, not all healthcare stocks are created equal. So what should investors be keying off of to find the, the real winners or, or winning areas within healthcare? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, what we've seen over the last 50 years is 49 years of uh, increased expenditures in healthcare in the United States. So that is across several recessions. Uh, it is very much a non-cyclical expense. Think about it, whether we're in a bad economy or a good economy, if you have a healthcare issue, you're going to spend money on it. That's, you know, that's very fundamental to uh, to the healthcare sector. Now, the opportunity here is that I think the markets have actually really punished a lot of growthier areas in healthcare this year. We've seen biotechs broadly sell off pretty significantly with higher rates. What the market is missing, though, is that there are a there are a lot of exciting drugs that have been under development that are in stage two, stage three trials that could see FDA approval. And suddenly they go from an expense of trying to develop the drug to a huge revenue generator if it's produced and, and has successful results. So we're seeing really exciting developments like in Alzheimer's where a recent stage three trial showed, you know, really one of the first successful treatments to Alzheimer's in over two decades. We're seeing common things like a flu vaccine, just using mRNA based vaccine technology, which is what really kind of got us through the COVID pandemic. Now we're seeing stage three trials for how that could be used to vaccinate against the flu, which if that is more successful, could be a $10 billion market uh, going forward. So we're seeing a lot of these new applications for medical breakthroughs, which are getting further and further along in their development. 2023 could be a pivotal year for uh, either uh, new, new uh, trial results or even FDA approvals or monetization, where we could see these biotechs going from kind of uh, uh, um, uh, hopeful uh, future revenue generators to actual revenue generators in 2023. And while those FDA, FDA approvals and trial results can be uh, big boons for some of these stocks, it can also uh, spark big hits to a, a number of companies if the trial results aren't exactly what uh, were expected. So how do investors adjust for that? Because if on the one hand, it's uh, we're in an environment where it's going to require us to be more selective, but at the same time, especially when it comes to biotechs, that single stock risk is still very real. It's a great point. I mean, I think this is really the value of ETFs that you can get a basket exposure to several of these companies simultaneously while still playing a very targeted theme. So, you know, within biotech, you, you know, we've built an ETF, uh, IBRN, which focuses specifically on neuroscience companies developing things like Alzheimer's drugs or Parkinson's, uh, which can really lead in a, in a really compelling growth area. Um, but at the same time, get diversification across 20, 30, maybe even 40 names across the basket. So I think that's really the right way to play it. There's a lot of volatility within some of these themes, but the idea is hopefully that you have, you know, a handful of winners that can really power the returns of a fund like that. 
And then elsewhere in technology, I would love to know more about what you're focused on because we're now entering a period where it seems like the, the mega cap techs have had their time in the sun. Let's now focus on that new leadership or maybe stocks that we did see well uh, perform well in 2020 or even before the pandemic, maybe coming back into the spotlight still in early stages of their growth trajectories. What are those areas? Yeah, I think the key here is looking at technology, not as a monolith, but as several different technologies wrapped together. And some of those technologies make more sense in this economic environment. So um, the pendulum has swung. Uh, there was a lot of excitement around moonshot technologies over the last few years, uh, where companies had very high valuations, were getting tons of investor money to build the next big thing. And while we still think that can be really exciting and there's a lot of opportunities in new technologies, in this economic environment, we think the markets are going to favor areas where cash flow is being produced, if not even profitability. So there's two technologies that we think are both very high growth and very exciting uh, for the next decade, but also have that cash flow and profitability perspective already. So that's cybersecurity. Uh, it's a theme you know, largely within the software space where these companies are protecting governments and corporations against cyber attacks, which have been up over 80% uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. So this is an area where even if we end up in more of a economically challenging environment and companies are cutting back on payroll or cutting back on discretionary spending, we do not see that happening in the cybersecurity space. In fact, there's surveys that show that companies expect to increase their amount of cyber of cybersecurity spent going forward. So very much a kind of non-cyclical within technology in our view. Um, and then secondly, uh, we're looking at robotics and artificial intelligence. A lot of these companies uh, have real products that are being monetized today and strong sales pipelines. Um, but the reality is in this economic environment where we have labor shortages, we still have very low unemployment, uh, we have uh, still uh, rising uh, labor costs. A lot of companies are going to look at how do we squeeze the most out of productivity? How do we get more from each worker? And a lot of that is robotics and artificial intelligence. If a robot can work alongside a human, to make them more productive or to take the more challenging tasks and allow humans to take the more kind of nuanced uh, or creative tasks, then we can see a real um, a real increase in productivity. So um, we see this as not only, you know, kind of a, a, a cash flow play in an, economic, in an economic recession, which could happen, but it's also um, a way to really kind of play the inflationary environment that we think is going to continue for a while. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned cash flow and profitability. So for all of the themes that we've discussed, uh, you know, EVs and clean energy, infrastructure, robotics, cyber, uh, you name it, biotechs as well. When you're looking in those themes, talk to us about how important it is to, you know, when you're separating the winners from the losers, biotechs maybe are, are kind of they're a different animal there, but that profitability, that's something that Investors Business Daily really is looking at closely, not only, um, you know, seeing early stage companies turning profitable, but also looking at uh, projections as well as a signal of health and leadership. How do you view those different metrics and their importance when you're analyzing, you know, what you should be putting in a basket of ETFs? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really a balance between what is the growth opportunity ahead and what is kind of the strength of a company in the near term. Um, and so when you look at something like robotics or cybersecurity, we're really excited about the growth prospects. I mean, I think we believe robotics is going to grow very quickly, that there's a lot of applications for robots within industrial warehousing, within manufacturing, uh, within healthcare, even with surgical robots or services industries. Um, but it's also not a moonshot technology. There's a lot of robotics companies that are building robotic arms that are profitable and being shipped around the world today. Uh, the importance of that is that because of inflation and because of volatility in the markets, there's less certainty around funding. So if we go back two years ago where valuations were very high and debt was very cheap, it was very easy for companies to get funding to fund new technologies that were unproven and hadn't been adopted by the broad markets yet. Now that's harder. So if a company wants to make a big bet on a new technology, it's an even it's an even bigger bet. It's more expensive bet because of you know where valuations and, and debt funding are today. So rather than focusing on that area, we're saying look at robots, look at cybersecurity, 
These are self-funded technologies in a lot of cases at this point. Because the companies are profitable, they can reinvest their own money. They don't have to go to the debt markets. They don't have to go to the stock market to raise capital. They can use their own profitability to power their growth going forward. And we think that is a very powerful stabilizer in this kind of economic environment. Do you think investors need to temper their expectations for the kind of returns in these sectors or because we've just seen a a pretty brutal bear market and especially for technology that extends uh, even beyond when we saw the overall market rolling over that that sets us up for uh, a big bounce here or how should we be thinking about potential returns? We're not saying higher or lower than in the past. I think we're saying the experience might be a little bit different. So again, going back to 20 and 2021, that secular bull market across growth is likely not to come back. And that was that just felt like an easy market to some people. Buy growth and see the returns. Um, that's unlikely to be the case. We have more volatility right now, so we don't think it's going to be the same kind of secular bull market, even if we do see some of these themes break out. There's probably going to be more volatility, and investors need to really think about it in the long term. Now, the positive is because there's more volatility and because there's higher rates, investors are being compensated in the form of lower valuations. So this can still be a good entry point, but investors need to know this could be a little bit riskier, a little bit more volatile of an experience than they saw in 2020 and 2021. Jay, as always, really appreciate your insights. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me, Alyssa. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you wanna watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.